AP Greer here from the Sentinels for Christ on this Friday installment of SFC's 15 in the Word, Mark chapter 6. We praise you and, and bless you in the name of Jesus. SFC 15 in the Word is a safe place, we think, for you to learn about the Christian worldview if you're seeking more information about God. And if you're specifically looking for information about Jesus, this is a safe place to learn about him. And we also bless those of you who uh, maybe you haven't made a decision to become a Christian. Maybe you're still searching um, and trying to find answers about Jesus. This is a safe place to where you can get answers about Jesus, not only in the realm of what we think is the spiritual realm, but also in the realm of what we think is the material realm as well. So as we jump into our Bible study today, uh, we've had a great week here at Sentinels for Christ. I just want to bless all of you and, and let you know, thank you again. So many of you bless us. Um, lay people in the church around the world. Um, I have no idea how many countries that we are in. Um, it, it's probably a huge number. I know that when we present the gospel, we're able to do it, at least in a written format, in some 26 different languages. And many people just bless us without an agenda from around the world. They don't ask for anything from us. And I received that. And I just want to read you one little uh, message from one of our brothers in Pakistan that I think that you're going to be blessed by. And um, he's been reaching out to us for a while, and we're, we bless him as well. And this is from uh, Aman, Azam, I'm sorry, who is in Pakistan. And he just writes us this simple little message uh, uh, this week, he says, I am thankful to God that after many days, God has made me stand in fellowship with you all once again. You see, it's been really rough in Pakistan, hard to connect the, with the church because of all of the anti-Christian feelings which have uh, been uh, demonstrated there recently. Make it right and move forward with you in the name of God. May you all be safe. May your families be safe. May your family be safe and the country should be safe. Amen. And we receive that blessing, Azam, in the name of Jesus, and we bless you and Pakistan too. And it is a privilege to know you, brother, um, and be fellowshipping with you in the name of Jesus. And it, it, I also want to uh, welcome some other folks that are with us. And you know, one of the neat things I get to, get to do, right, is see how many people around the world this gospel presentation, this Bible study reaches, and we're able to do it through Facebook, through the platform of social media, and we're thankful that we're able to do it through Facebook. And one of the reasons that we're successful uh, with that is we simply don't get distracted with political, argumentative, uh, conflict-driven things. We tell you about Jesus, and it's my hope that we always continue to do that. But I want to welcome Nilo, okay, from Pakistan this morning. I also want to welcome Ramuald from Burkina Faso. We're blessing that area in Africa, Ramuald, okay? And I also want to uh, bless uh, Sintiyehu from Ethiopia this morning. They're just three people. But do you know that other than these three other people, that 279 people since Monday of this week decided to follow us at Sentinels for Christ? We bless you. Um, let us know how we're doing. Let us know what the Lord is doing in your life. And, and um, you may provide the opportunity for us to share your blessing with the worldwide community. And that just builds us all up in Jesus' name. And, and I just want to encourage the worldwide community for a couple uh, uh, minutes here before we get into uh, Mark chapter 6. And it's in this. You know, Europe is shaken by the Ukraine conflict. Every aspect of European life, whether or not it's Western Europeans or Eastern Europeans, um, from Russia to Spain, Portugal. It's shaken by what's going on in there. Things are difficult, okay? There's a shaking going on in Northern Africa, whether or not um, you are aware of it or not. And, and while nations may not be in armed conflict yet there, um, they are definitely taking conflict-oriented measures against each other. And it's difficult for people in the area of Niger because of the closing of borders and, and things. It's difficult, okay? in the border area between Pakistan and India, where these two great nations are, they're experiencing a lot of conflict, a lot of political conflict, which always translates into socio-economical conflict. And there's conflict on the border between India, okay, and, and China as well. And you simply can't miss, um, if you are informed, okay, whether or not you're a Christian or not, that there is a, 
uh, an elevated level, I think, really of conflict that is taking place in the world right now between East okay, and West, which seems to have really, it's just really accelerated probably over the last week as we've seen what has happened between one of the G7 countries um, and India itself. We, we, you will not find peace in this world, okay? You may use the resources of this world to feed yourself, to raise your family, to, uh, to, to take care of your life here on earth, but you won't find peace in it. Je that was what Jesus said, okay? You will only find peace ultimately in Jesus. And this world is, is it's in the process of being transformed, okay, into a kingdom which is going to be managed personally by God the Father himself and the presence of his son, Jesus Christ, in a way where all these things that I just mentioned that are going wrong with the world, and that's just a small part of it. We haven't even gotten into the natural disasters, okay? And people who are so sort of poor that they can't feed themselves or their families. All of it's going to go away in Christ. And the, the message of Sentinels of Christ is simply you can partner with what that new world's going to be like by receiving Jesus in your life, okay? And as we jump into the Bible today, I just want you to ask yourself, where are you with Jesus? Do you know him? Are you walking with him? Jesus said that if we love him, we'll obey his commands. And that really can only happen as God dwells within us, which will be a message of what we talk about today. So let's go ahead and jump into our Bible study today from Mark chapter 6, okay? The historical person of John the Baptist. So Mark 6 it's a, it's a pretty long chapter. It's one of the longest chapters, okay, in the New Testament. It's over 50 verses. So we're going to read this uh, section on uh, it and then uh, end with some discussions about John the Baptist and why it's important. So Jesus is at the center of his ministry about halfway, most likely through the three years that he was ministering and proclaiming the kingdom of God on earth. And it he's just released the twelve. Uh, apostles and disciples, okay, in the uh, 10th chapter of Matthew and in the 6th chapter of Mark to take his message out. They were trained and they were ready, okay. There is no such thing as going out and proclaiming the gospel without any training, okay. You at least need training from a relationship with the Holy Spirit. But Jesus saw fit that before he sent those 12 out by themselves, in pairs by the way, that he trained them for a year and a half. He's just sent them out and he's continuing to minister, and the narrative of the story of Jesus picks up here in Mark 6, verse 13. Now, King Herod heard about all that was going on with Jesus, because Jesus had become well known. And some were saying, John the Baptist has risen from the dead, and that's why these miraculous powers are at work in him, referring to Jesus. Others were saying, he is Elijah, and still others referring to Jesus said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets from long ago. But when Herod heard all these things, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. But Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had bound and put him in prison. And he did this because of Herodias, Herod's brother Philip's wife. Whom John, whom he had married, but John had been saying to King Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias, his new wife, nursed a grudge against him and wanted to kill John. But she was not able to do so because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. And when Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, a great opportunity came forward, and on his birthday, Herod gave himself a banquet for all his high officials and all his important military commanders and all the leading men of Galilee. And when the daughter of his wife came in and she danced, she pleased Herod and amazed all of his dinner guests. And Herod said to the girl, ask for me anything you want and I'll give it to you. You see, anyone who promises anyone something like that has obviously drank too much wine. Herod's drunk. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you want, up to half of my kingdom, I will give it to you. What a foolish thing to say to a young girl, right? Who just danced for you. 
So she went in and she asked her mother, what should I ask for? And her mother sent her back to the king saying, ask for the head of John the Baptist to be delivered. And at once the girl hurried back to the king and with this request from her mom, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Now the king was shocked, but because of the oath he made in front of his dinner guests, he didn't want to refuse this young girl. And so he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went and beheaded John in the prison and brought back his head on the platter. He presented it to the girl and she gave it to her mother. And on hearing this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Let's talk for a few minutes about John the Baptist in a way where I hope that you will be uh, blessed in the name of Jesus, okay? John the Baptist was uh, a cousin of Jesus, probably a first cousin, very close to him, okay? We're told this because in the Gospel of Luke, which covers more of the early years and relationships between Jesus and the people associated with Jesus' family's life than any of the other Gospels, that John's mother, okay, was the cousin to Jesus' mom, Mary, okay? So Jesus simply knew John very well. And we are told at the beginning of all the Gospels, all four Gospels, that John had a ministry given from God as the precursor, the forerunner of Jesus, to proclaim that God's favor was coming, that Messiah was appearing now on earth in the form of Jesus. And that was John's ministry. We are told in the third chapter of Matthew and in the third chapter of uh, the Gospel of Luke, in the first chapter of Mark, and in the first chapter of uh, also John the following, that when John was questioned, okay, by the religious rulers of his time, because they wanted to know why this unusual man who was dressed like a wild man was out baptizing people saying the kingdom of God is coming to repent. You see, the, the, the religious rulers, they recognized a prophetic anointing on John. So they sent their representatives to ask John who he was and why he was baptizing. Okay. And John's testimony in all of the Gospels was this. Okay. Don't look at me. I'm really unworthy to be looked at. There's one coming after me that I've been sent to announce to you. I am not even worthy to put on his shoe. So this was John's testimony to Jesus Christ. And then John went on to say something else about Jesus that we simply can't miss. John said, I baptize you with water, but the one coming after me, referring to Jesus, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And that's really where I want to lean into today. John's testimony of Jesus was that those who are willing to take Jesus as their Savior would have the Spirit of God again restored to them, okay? That was God's intention from the beginning that has been separated from mankind because of the sin of mankind. That restorative Spirit of God would come through the advent of Jesus Christ. How do we get it? By acknowledging Jesus as who he said he was, the Son of God and the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door, Jesus said. He's the only door to restoration with the Father. And it was this John's testimony that we see silenced in this chapter, that John was killed by King Herod Antipas of this time. And it's, it's a rather sad ending, isn't it, for a prophet? Beloved, do you remember we started out today saying that you won't find peace on the earth? If you are a citizen of the kingdom of God, okay, that citizenship is at odds with or antagonistic against the kingdom of this world, okay? You will live a life, if you follow Jesus, that will be in direct conflict with the world. Now, hear what I'm saying, beloved. I'm not saying that does not give you license, that does not give you approval to be a, a rebel against governments. If you think that I am suggesting that, you are greatly wrong. The scripture does not support that. The scripture says you're to be the best citizen possible. Right up to the point where someone tells you to deny Jesus Christ, and then it's okay to say, no, I won't be in compliance about that. But John, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, 
this amazing man of God was killed simply because he spoke out about what was ungodly because he loved his nation of Israel. John understood Israel's destiny and Israel's destiny was not stopped when Israel was as a nation destroyed back in AD 70. Just because the nation of Israel and the Jewish people look like, gosh, they can't get traction and there's so much antagonism around them, by no means is God's blessing been removed from Israel. Israel is going to be elevated, all right, to an international status at the return of Jesus Christ in a way where you and I simply can not imagine because that's the fulfillment of God's promise to them. It's part of the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. And because John knew all this as a prophet and knew the all, all the Old Testament writings as a prophet because John was a prophet, it broke his heart to see that one of the kings of Israel was such a wicked man, Herod Antipas, and that what Herod had actually done that had gotten John in trouble was Herod had called, I'm sorry, John had called out King Herod who had in a despicable act, okay? He had taken his brother's wife, Herodias, and he had married her. So he had encouraged Herodias to divorce his brother, Philip, and then he married his brother's wife. What kind of insane knucklehead does that type of thing on the face of the earth? I'll tell you who does that. Someone who is extremely broken and extremely in need of God's restoration in his life. And because Herod was the leader of the Jewish nation, and John understood the relationship between national leadership and the destiny and health of a nation. He called out Herod and he said, it's unlawful for you to do that. Now, here's what Herod could have done. He could have come around to repentance and said, he's right. The Jewish law says there's no way I should be able to take my brother's wife. But he didn't do that. He kept this woman as his wife. And because he did that. And because everyone lost face and was embarrassed because of what John said, they locked him up and they tried to silence him, okay? The gospel is not silenced because people are thrown in jail, all right? The gospel usually flourishes more that the people of God are persecuted. So this is why this is listed in the scriptures that we are not to be discouraged because John the Baptist was killed. It is a turning point in Jesus' ministry, which is extremely important, which is going to give us insight into the feeding of the 5,000, which is the next miracle that takes place that we will talk about after this. Because what we see as defeat in the earth, what is going wrong, and it discourages us, okay? The wars, the political infighting between nations. God is not intimidated by it. Jesus is still king over all the earth. And the Lord God who created men and women will ultimately have his way. But to have fellowship in that kingdom, it's invitational, brothers and sisters. It's an invitation. And for those who have proclaimed to be in Christ and are following him and claim to be a Christian, well, then we have to maintain relationship in Christ, which means just like a marriage, okay? And the health of a marriage requires man and woman to be getting along, okay? Trying to get to know each other, um, giving up sometimes what they think is important to bless the other people. That mirror image is given to us as a blessing so that we understand <laughs> that relationship with God really requires the same thing. Now, God's the perfect spouse. God does not have to change who he is to have relationship with us. But I tell you what God did as the perfect spouse to have relationship with us. He sent his son Jesus to die so that the brokenness of our relationship with God would be covered up by the death of his son on the cross by his divine blood. You see, there is simply no restoration and forgiveness for what is offensive to God other than anything through Jesus Christ. And then we enter into a relationship if we partner with that. And then it's up to us. And trust me, when it's up to us to have a relationship with God, the quality of our relationship with God, it's not your pastor's fault. It's not your church's fault. It's not people who offend you in the name of Jesus, okay? It's not people who are other Christians who determine the quality of your relationship with God. It's you, okay? Because 
you were called to have a relationship, which means you have to readjust who you are in your mind and in your person to have a quality relationship with God. And when you realize that, and when you step into that, and when you start coming underneath that baptism of the Holy Spirit that you receive in Jesus' name, which was the testimony of John that we're talking about today, okay? When you come underneath that authority, then you will have a trustworthiness established between you and God that the relationship takes off and becomes more and more and more amazing. Do you want a more amazing life in Christ? Be like Mary. Listen at Jesus' feet. Do you want a more amazing life in Christ? Make the priority obeying his commands. Here's an easy one, okay? Jesus said, they'll know you're my disciples by how you love one another. Do you love each other in the church, brethren? Are you so spiritually sensitive, okay, to God's movement in your life that when he whispers to you to love each other in the church, that one of the priorities in your prayer life is that you pray for others in the church? Because I tell you, if you're following the commands of Jesus, you will pray for the other people in your church because that's where the unity and the koinonia and the amazingness of the Christian church and the people of God is a testimony to the rest of the world when we pray and stop and slow our lives down enough to care for them and pray for them. That's a first, that's an entry point into spiritual maturity. Now, let me tell you something. I've been a Christian for uh, 40 plus years and very few Christians actually spend very much time praying for other people in the church. You know what that tells me? Very few Christians are actually mature disciples. We want to be mature, trustworthy disciples because it's only then that we get the assignments. That will change our community, circumstances in our life, maybe circumstances in our family, and even our nation. Remember we started talking out about nations? So as you go forth today, as you go forth with the rest of this week, I bless you in the name of Jesus that you will become the salt and the light that Jesus wants you to become first and the closest people in your family, okay? If you can't do it there, you won't do it anywhere else. Then spread that love out in the name of Jesus with the Holy Spirit living through you to the church. Then you'll be ready to get assignments to go beyond the church to the community outwards and to the nations and to the world in Jesus' name. J.P. Greer here from Sentinels for Christ, SFC 15 of the world. Blessing you on this September 22nd already. We'll see each other again on Monday, where we'll spend some time talking about Mark's account of the feeding of the 5,000, which I think it's really going to bless you because it is related intimately and personally by Jesus and his relationship really with John the Baptist. Until then, be blessed in Jesus' name.